Well, hello, my name is Haley McNamara. I'm a vice president at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation and director of our international division. And I am thrilled to be hosting this panel that's gonna be incredibly powerful with experts from around the world. So I would love to start off with each of you giving a quick introduction of who you are, where you are, and your work. Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Every Hi everyone. Thank you, Haley. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I am from the southeastern area of the United States, and my name is Sarah McDougall. I am an author and an abuse recovery coach and the co-founder of Wilderness to Wild and the Trauma Mamas mobile app. So we work with women who, and in about 45 countries in our group, and um, we provide online courses, coaching, and community for women who are recovering from betrayal trauma and domestic violence and who are rebuilding a healthy, safe home environment after trauma. Lisa. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Lisa Taylor. I'm actually situated in New Zealand, uh, where I'm a clinical counselor. I do, um, I'm also a researcher, um, an author. Um, I do most of my work these days in counseling with uh, Naked Truth Recovery, which is an agency based out of the UK, where you are, Haley. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, our agency really just focuses on working with the person struggling with uh, sexual addiction, pornography addiction, uh, also the partners of of those people. We run groups, we see people one on one. And uh, we've been at that work now for about five to six years and growing all the time because, you know, unfortunately the work is growing. Um, but really, you know, so glad to be able to have opportunities to educate and advocate. And uh, I'm really honored to be here with you and with this amazing group of women. Thank you for joining us, M Melinda. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Haley. Melinda Tankard Reist. I'm calling in from Australia and privileged to be part of this panel. I'm a writer and speaker. I've just launched uh, book number seven with Spinifex Press. He chose porn over me, women harmed by men who use porn. I'm the movement director for Collective Shout for a World Free of Sexploitation. Uh, we've partnered with Haley and her colleagues globally in a number of campaigns and thankful to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Anne. Mm -hmm. I'm Anne. That's a pseudonym that I use. I'm a podcaster. I podcast at Betrayal Trauma Recovery. And the podcast grew into an awesome daily online support group. We have about eight coaches that work at Betrayal Trauma Recovery. And um, it, you, it goes all the time. There's four sessions a day on most weekdays. And on the weekends, there's a few sessions. So we're kind of like the ER. So if someone's having an issue, they can get into us right away. I also wrote a picture book for adults. It's not an adult picture book. It's a picture book for adults called Trauma Mama Husband Drama. And you can find that on our website, which is btr.org. Oh, wonderful. Thank you all so much for joining. And I just encourage everyone listening to go into the show notes and go to all of these uh, websites because what incredible resources you all represent. Um, some, some people who are tuning in might be surprised at first actually to see this topic as part of the CEASE Summit because we're hearing increasingly in the world about the harms of pornography to pornography users, such as impacts to public health or to their brains. Um, but we don't as often hear about its impact on partners of pornography users uh, or others in their lives. Why do you think that is? Who are you throwing to there, Hailey? I'm throwing it <laughs> open. Melinda, would you like to begin? Well enough, yes. Uh, so, yeah, I felt that the lived experience of the partners of habitually porn consuming men uh, had not been thoroughly examined and explored. I felt that those women survivors were collateral damage in their partner's habitual consumption, but almost ignored in the public discourse around habitual porn use or pornography more generally and 
part of what I've always tried to do as a writer over many years is to document the experiences of women, personal narratives. And I met, uh, I posted just before Christmas, the story of a young woman who'd called off her wedding in the same week that she discovered that her fiance was a compulsive porn user and the floodgates opened. So many women said, I wish I'd known before I got married. I wish I'd heard the advice, don't date men who use porn. You know, I wish I'd known ahead of time. I wish I'd recognized the red flags. And so many stories started to come in. And then I read an outstanding piece by, by Sarah, who's with us today, asking the question, why choose to walk into hell? And it was really summarizing where you might end up if you enter a relationship with a habitual porn user. And it really just perfectly captured what I was trying to do with this book. One was a warning to, to younger women, don't date men who use porn. And secondly, to acknowledge the pain, the trauma, the emotional abuse, uh, the sexual abuse, the sense of betrayal, the erosion of the humanity of the partner, the, the sacrifice of the, the total loss of self, um, erosion of boundaries of the survivor. Uh, so many stories came in. And I wanted to give those women permission really to see that they shouldn't have to sacrifice their entire lives uh, to this man. Some of these women had been in these relationships for 20 or 30 years and were always waiting for that magical day when he would change, but he hadn't done the work. There was no intention to change. And so it was really a permission giving book to these women to recognize themselves as really survivors of, of violence and abuse and mistreatment and to, to exit if they possibly could get out and run for, run for their lives. So I don't even remember the original question, but it was excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a thought. Yes. Um, so for a long time, working with wives of pornography users was mm. such a weird, like, how do we define this? What is our role? How do we mm -hmm. do this? And as a, um, my ex was a pornography, he's still a pornography user, but back in the day, um, I thought my role was to support his pornography addiction recovery. I thought my role was to be a safe person for him and not shame him and all of these other things. I did not understand at the time that I was being abused. It was an abuse situation mm -hmm. and that I was being asked to tolerate abuse. And not only that, to basically enable it by not shaming him, quote unquote. I mean, you should treat people kindly, but in other words, like to not express to him how stressful it was and how upset I was. I was also constantly being lied to, manipulated, gaslit. And this was from a man who was supposedly in recovery, who was going to recovery meetings and doing those things. It was really interesting to me that after seven years of doing this, not one pornography addiction recovery professional indicated to me that I was being abused. That did not come up. It was not in the discussion. And so I realized wait a minute, I, I started going down the abuse road instead of the pornography addiction recovery road and found that all of the materials, um, it was just check, 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 check. And I, what I really had been dealing with me was abuse. Mm -hmm. I was an abuse victim and at BTR, we specialize in emotional and psychological abuse and sexual coercion, because most of the time when you say abuse, people think he's punching you in the face or something, but this type of abuse is um, mainly, and, and not that it doesn't become physical because it does, but it's mainly emotional and psychological and sexual coercion. And when I say sexual coercion, I mean that these are women who don't know that they have, that someone is, that their partner, that their husband is acting outside of the boundaries that they've set for their marriage. They want a monogamous relationship. They don't want porn to be happening. And so they're never able to even give their consent to be in a sexual relationship with this person. Mm -hmm. So that consent issue isn't there. It amounts to sexual coercion and it's an abuse issue. It's not an addiction issue. When I finally put two and two together and thank goodness, Sarah and Lisa and Melinda and all of us sort of in independently working in our own spheres, 
we we kind of came to these conclusions all sort of at the similar times, I think, because we've all been working on this for years and years and years. Um, and it's, it, I am so validated to have other women who came to that conclusion too. So I'm not trying to say I was the only one that did this, but it was, it was, I think for every woman, it's sort of like their own personal journey of these epiphanies. And then we realize, oh, other women are having these and we connect and realize, no, this is really what it is. This is an abuse issue. But I do think that because of the abuse, because of the gaslighting, the manipulation, um, the coercion, that is the last thing that anybody wants to hear. They do not want to talk about the, that women, wives of porn users are being abused. And I'm going to speak when I speak in a gender segregated way, because my community is only women who are abused by male porn users. Um, but I recognize that women use pornography as well. I want to like, just get that out, you know, recognize that and, and validate that as well. But I, the, the, I think that's one of the reasons why this hasn't really come to light is because everyone is trying to avoid that like giant abuse word, like the plague, they do not want it brought up and they do not want to address it because it's mm. really big. And it has to do with more than just the, the clicking on the porn. It mm. has to do with their entire character. And it's very, very dangerous for women and for families. Well, that's, that's kind of like what Dr. Omar Manwala talks about with the deceptive sexual trauma and the deceptive sexual basement or the secret sexual basement and how being deceptive about one's sexuality in a relationship where there are expectations of monogamy and of faithfulness and of sexual loyalty, uh, that deception creates trauma. Uh, another really great author about this is Dr. Barbara Steffens, whose book that came out over 10 years ago, um, Your Sexually Addicted Spouse, yeah, I had to stop and think about it there for a second, um, was recognizing this was not a codependency issue. It was a trauma issue. So I think one of the reasons, uh, there's a couple of reasons in my mind, but I think one of the big ones to answer your original question, Haley, that we have not traditionally heard as much about the impact on porn users' partners is because for decades, all of the literature was just saying that porn users' partners were just codependent. They were addicted to the addict. They were basically all in the same basket and they weren't recognizing the trauma from mm -hmm. a from a research literature and from a, a, a therapeutic point of view. Mm -hmm. Now there's been tremendous strides made just in the last five to 10 years in recognizing and treating this very differently. I think in another 10 years, it's going to, the landscape is going to be completely different than it is now. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to seeing that because we've got a long ways to go, but Can I had to stop. Sorry, go on Sarah. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Well, just the other thing that no, go ahead, Melinda. Because I was, was going to go to another there, reason. I also go think ahead. we need to situate this as part of the uh, PR spin of the global porn industry that's told women there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Uh, you're <laughs> prudish. You're hung up. You need to get drunk and get that monkey off your back that tells you you don't like porn. That's what one woman that I quoted in my book was told. The whole therapeutic industry has not uh, focused on the behavior of the male but on the uh, inadequacy of the female mm -hmm. and that she's hung up. She needs to loosen up. She needs to consume porn with him. It's, it's, it's all put on her. And there's example after example in the book. And I think this is another major reason that the woman victim has been ignored is because, uh, well, not just ignored, actually blamed, blamed. for the situation. Mm -hmm. You're not giving him enough sex. You're not willing to try different things. You, you're, right. you know, you've got a, a hang up about bondage and strangulation. Uh, you know, you, it's but your fault, basically. I think, I think there's still a couple more to add on to this while we're doing that. And, and that is one, like from the time girls hit middle school and goodness, it, it may be younger now, but definitely by the time girls hit middle school, mm. The material, the media, the Hollywood stuff, regardless of whatever culture you're in, whatever the pop social media is in your country, mm. it's teaching you yep. that being sexually desired is a desirable thing. Mm -hmm. It's also teaching you 
that boys don't control themselves, period. Mm -hmm. Guys are dogs. You are meat. And if you're a brave, courageous, confident girl, you're going to be showing it off and you're going to be appreciating all of the slavering that the dogs are doing over the meat. I mean, it just, we're just going to get really crass about it. That's what Mm -hmm. girls, everything from movies to TV shows, to anime, to music, to whatever is teaching girls as young as 10 or 11. And then all of a sudden we get older and then guys are addicted to porn. Well, that's just what all guys do. Right. So why should I have this traumatic response to something that society has told me is okay. And then you take it one step further in religious circles, you have the additional layer of not only all the religious girls getting exposed on some level to those messages from mainstream media, because they all soak it up at least a little bit, unless you're like way out on a plantation somewhere in the middle of nowhere, but you know, pretty much all of them are soaking it up just a little bit. And, and then on top of that, For those who are in any type of purity culture where women's virginity is highly prized as some kind of sacred treasure, then on top of that, you have that your divine mandate as a female is to provide sexual relief to your partner. So if you are, if if your partner is going to porn, then the automatic conclusion without anyone telling you so is that you are a failure. Mm -hmm. Why would any girl want to go or woman want to go and be like, Hey, pick me. I completely suck as a wife. I'm a failure. Please tell me how I can be less of a failure. Who wants to go admit that Mm -hmm. when society says you're supposed to be okay with it Mm -hmm. and whatever your religious structure says, is that you, that is your function in life. You are there to meet his needs. He has needs. You don't have these needs. And this is your job. If you fail at your job, you have failed as a human. Yeah. Lisa, have you all, what else have you uh... Girls. I'm so glad you mentioned the grooming of girls in the culture. I've just come back from weeks of travel across the country and the stories I'm hearing are getting worse. And I didn't think that would be possible, but it is. And I've been talking to young women who have been in coercive, controlling, brutal, degrading relationships from the age of 12. So already by 15, 16, uh, they've experienced violence as normal everyday behaviour because the culture has groomed them to accept sexual assault as part of a empowering relationship. Mm -hmm. And therefore we see girls, young girls on TikTok fantasising about being choked, being covered in bruises, being strangled as though this is desirable. It's a trending hashtag on TikTok called KinkTok, if you haven't seen that. And I'm seeing it play out. I'm now speaking to primary school girls uh, telling me that boys expect to choke them, that boys demand they send nudes. Just last week, girls, young girls were telling me that teenage boys were threatening them saying, if you don't send me a naked picture, I am going to rape and murder your mother and your sisters. And these were teen boys telling this to underage girls. And the girls thought they were saving his life. They were saving, the girls thought they were saving the lives of their mothers and sisters by sending the images. Mm -hmm. Parents are telling me their daughters um, as young as 12 and 13 are getting notes in their lockers every day, uh, threatening to, to rape to rape them and this is the outworking of of porn culture so I'm really glad you mentioned that Sarah about the role of culture in normalizing this debasement and degradation so by the time they end up in a relationship with a habitual porn consuming uh, man they're not prepared for that (laughs) they're not they don't even understand it's wrong because it's become so embedded and normal in the culture and, and, and you're talking about that being embedded and normal in this just the mainstream secular culture I'm assuming these are like straight community schools, government schools, every public school, schools, whatever. Okay. this is the Everywhere. tragedy, every school, even faith-based so, schools, the stories are no different. Yeah. So just yesterday, I was reading one of the flagship books about purity dating culture. I was going back to honestly, to give myself headaches, but I was, I was looking at what trash was available 
-hmm. as Christian dating advice when I was in late high school and college. Mm -hmm. And one of the books that was incredibly popular bestseller in like the late nineties, mid nineties was it, it tells a story of a girl who was 12 and she had been made friends with by an older teen boy, like 16, 17 years old at youth group. And he had seemed like a big brother to her. She visited him and it says she left like a used up sex toy, never to be whole again. It never says, and a predatorial older teen boy raped her. Yeah. Right. It blames the full weight of responsibility on her for being trusting, for being innocent, for being gullible, and then for being used. Yeah, and that's and being coerced or raped. And, and yes, so it's her fault and it's her dirtiness. There was no mention that someone should have wrapped that girl up and taken her to the police station and the boy should have been prosecuted. And and that was in one of the best selling very conservative religious dating books. So even if a girl you're thinking, well, but if she's like, she's going to church, so she's getting healthier messages. No, no, she's not. Mm -hmm. She's not getting healthier sexual messages necessarily from her youth group materials than this mm -hmm. that we're seeing right now, 30 years later. And Lisa, what have you been seeing in the course of your work as well along these so lines? I think these guys have done a really good job of covering like, like there's the broader cultural messages. There's the there's my my inner sanctum community, right? My religious community maybe giving me the same kinds of messages. And then I'm in this relationship, I go to seek help and I find myself presented with a victim blaming model. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to just collapse and despair at that point because everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet, it sounds like. And, and I agree with Sarah that we are very fortunate that we've had a shift since I think Barb Steffens really led that in the, you know, and there were people like Sue Johnson and so forth behind her that were even talking trauma related to any kind of infidelity a little bit earlier than Barb and helped inform some of Barb's work. Um, but that really began the shift in the, the therapeutic area that I work in from this victim blaming uh, stance mm -hmm. to you know, slowly, slowly <laughs> open us to hang on. These people are of equal value. They are not part of the problem. They are the victims. They need to be seen and treated. And now we have some couples models that we're beginning to, um, to work from. Let's start with the, you know what, dude, you know, and I'm going to, yeah, I agree. It's sometimes it's, it's the women who are, who are the sex addict and it's the male, it's the male who is the partner majority of time that's not the case so you know what brother you know what you broke this you've got to fix it you want if you want this relationship healed it's not on her it's on you you're going to lead that process so we've we've seen slowly 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 this swing towards getting the person with the addiction no not just focusing on him as oh poor you we've got to help you and women buying into that because I've been told, you know, I'm, you know, this is my job. This is, this is, you know, it's all about him. I've, I've been very conditioned to believe that. Um, actually standing up and saying, you know what, I'm going to use boundaries. I'm mm -hmm. going to, I'm going to stand up for, for my values. And you can either come to the party or not, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I'm standing firm in that. And I have a, I have a therapeutic community that's supporting me now in that. Mm -hmm. I think I this, wanna... oh, go on. Mm -hmm. When we talk about trauma, trauma was brought into the conversation, which was great. But I still think in, in total, in general, the therapeutic community in, in when we talk about porn addiction is missing the cause of the trauma. They'll talk about maybe her finding out about it or maybe um, the day she found porn on her computer and somehow this disclosure or this discovery caused the trauma rather than realizing mm. that years of systematic abuse is what yeah. caused the trauma. Abuse is what is causing the trauma, it, both abuse from the perpetrator, their spouse, but also the systematic type of abuse that we're talking about. So when Melinda was speaking about all these horrific examples, those are abuse examples. They're not pornography addiction examples. This is uh, same thing with Sarah. This is a sort of systemic societal gaslighting of women. And it's tantamount to 
societal abuse of women. And that is what porn culture is all about. And that's what all of us are working to fight. I Can think I steal that phrase, societal gaslighting? That's that's a perfect sure. summary. Thank you. Well. I'll, 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 I'll attribute to you and thank you. Thank you. And I think that naturally leads um, to the next topic, which is, you know, it there is this old cliche that pornography can be used to spice up sex in a relationship or that a partner is prudish if they're not interested in pornography um, being an aspect of either their partner's sex life or their joint sex life. Uh, so how does pornography impact sexual relationships? Mm -hmm. There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, when you think, I, I think a lot of that hinges on well, I, I would say it's always harmful, but I think an awareness of the negative impact often hinges on how you define sex in the first place. Now, see, for me, I have the expectations for sex as something that is beautiful, intimate, and safe between two committed individuals. So when I'm thinking about sexual activity based on my worldview, I'm, I'm thinking of it as a husband and wife who are loyal to each other, who are faithful to each other, and who are keeping those promises so that this is a safe, protected environment. Whatever is going wrong in the world out there, it is not messing things up here. Now, if you're thinking of sex as just simply like a hit and run kind of interaction with another warm body, then we probably wouldn't see eye to eye on the potential negative impact of and, and, and harm of porn, right? But if you're thinking about sex as being that that kind of sacred safe space between two people that two people create for each other mutually, then we're thinking about that as, as something that you do together. Porn is voyeurism. Mm. It's, it's, it's straight up just getting off on watching somebody else do the things. And there's, I, I was just watching a TED talk this week. Oh, this Israeli guy. I'm going to have to Google his name now. Do you know who I'm talking mean. about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Basically saying that porn has reduced things to just body parts. Yes. Just, just yeah. penetrative, yeah. penetrative actions. And it removes the hands and the caressing and the narrative between two people, all the things that make sex beautiful and exciting, as opposed to just the thrusting. Can I speak and, to some of the experiences of the women in, in the book on this? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the women said that porn consumption changed the way their partner acted towards them. Uh, Florence writes, he used me like a blow up doll. Uh, women told of a total lack of respect for boundaries and overblown sense of entitlement and expectation that they would provide sex on demand and participate in sex acts they found demeaning and degrading they had to replicate the performance of women in the porn industry with the partners expecting a porn star experience um, it was very difficult for them to refuse sex in fact refusal was just another porn genre like forced right. and violated so for the men it was right. actually a bit of a turn on uh, when she refused because a uh, coerced sex violation forced is a very popular genre in porn um, forcing compliance was a part of their sexual repertoire uh, for example uh, Kate wrote he would after being forced to perform sexual tasks for his own pleasure I'd lie in bed and cry silently women talked about being emotionally abused for saying no and for men um, the woman was his sexual property he was he owned her and she had to do whatever he wanted at the more at the most violent end I mean it was all experienced as violence but a number of the women in the book well, described uh, near-death experiences from, mm. uh, from strangulation, which, as Sarah has pointed out, is a red flag for homicide. Uh, a number of the women were, were raped by their partners. Uh, one passed out after being um, choked. Uh, two women were pressured into sex shortly after the birth of a child, mm. uh, with one woman describing the agony of, of torn stitches. Mm. Uh, so... You know, it is right to situate this as 
as abuse because that, that's how the women experienced it. And that's, that's why I have comment. described this as, a, as part of domestic violence and it needs to be acknowledged as that. Mm -hmm. There's another issue of the exact uh, of sexual neglect, right? So you, you do have yes. um, the men wanting sex from their wives in coercive ways. You also have men who yes. just don't pay attention to their wives. They're not caring. They never mm -hmm. like cherish or care or nothing. Mm -hmm. um, it's just basically sexual neglect where their mm -hmm. wife is just, I guess their roommate and makes dinner mm -hmm. and takes care of the kids, but mm -hmm. they don't like plan dates or try to help out or do anything mm -hmm. to, to initiate a sexual relationship because they're mm -hmm. getting all of their sexual quote unquote needs, which is a ridiculous way of describing it. I want to just say their sexual desires are fulfilled through Fetishes. pornography, prostitution, mm -hmm. um, any kind of masturbation, you know, other, other forms, not their wife. Mm -hmm. So that's another side yes. of that coin. Yes. And I'll add to that in terms of that side of the coin, women, mm -hmm. sometimes when they are, they themselves initiate sex are then ridiculed. They're, belittled, down. they're, they're emotionally abused in the turning mm -hmm. down. Right. So, yep. so that you're level too of fat. I'm not abusive. really attracted to you anyway. You know, that exactly. Kind of yeah. Yes. I, I would say, so I was, I was married to a compulsive porn user, um, and experienced a tremendous amount of deception of sexual trauma for 13 years. And, um, in that journey and now working with thousands and thousands of women who have experienced this whole spectrum of different profiles of guys, you know, there's the guys who like wanted it five times a day. And there's the guys who completely ignored their wives. What mm. I have never yet heard is that my husband's porn consumption mm. made him a, an attentive, compassionate and patient and fabulous lover. I've never heard that yet in thousands. And, and what I do hear is that he, he was transformed into almost a bestial kind of an animalistic uh, forcefulness or robotic, completely unimaginative, completely dry and methodical and just all about mechanical. Some of the women mechanical use that, that yes, mm. mechanical, get himself across the finish line. And who cares if you had fun in the process and then he's done and, you know, uh, or, or completely ignoring, but never do I hear that my husband's porn use turned mm. him into this wonderful intimate magnetic lover. I also think it's really interesting that a lot of women report being abused. They'll say, I was in an abusive relationship. He lied. He was disabled. He was a jerk, you know, all this stuff. And then I'll mm -hmm. say, um, did he use porn? And they say, well, yeah, but that wasn't the problem. Oh, yes, like, no, 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 no. Like the porn didn't <laughs> cause anything. I don't know what you're talking about. And, but mm -hmm. yeah, he was this awful person. It would have been, the porn was nothing. Like it would mm -hmm. have been fine if he just would have been nice and, you know, all of this stuff, they don't really recognize that the two things are tied together and mm -hmm. you know, probably because they live in this culture where porn's not bad. So it's like, yeah, of course you drink milk, but that wasn't the problem. He's abusive. Right. And I think mm -hmm. that's kind of an, another interesting thing that comes from women who don't maybe necessarily think that porn is bad and they know it's happening, but they're like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's not an issue. The issue was his lying and all the other things. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we have this huge body of literature that shows an association between attitudes conducive about porn use and attitudes conducive to violence against women or actual acts of violence against women, mm -hmm. like huge body of literature. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, my recent study is adds a little piece in there and it's a piece that focuses on, let's hear from partners of sex addicts. What's their experiences of violence? Well, that was 92% of them, 558 women, 92% of them had ever experienced violence. That is way beyond their normal background rates for the countries they live in. If we just looked at physical and sexual, so you were talking about sexual was, was your question. 41% of them said yes on, on three very standard measures that, for example, the UN has used in, the, in a lot of their, their prevalent studies, uh, DV prevalent studies, 41% of them had experienced sexual violence based on those measures. Um, when we talk about severe intimate partner violence, so the choking wasn't involved in the, the UN sexual question, it was involved in their physical. Um, and my 
supervisor and I, we changed that to any form of, of air constriction mm -hmm. because because so time, often women think of two hands round throat, right? But any form of air constriction can, you know, is, is as Melinda said, a red flag for homicide. So th we, that was the only question, we altered it just slightly. Um, so when we look at those kind of severe life-threatening levels of physical and match that with, with um, sexual, 48% of these partners of sex acts had, ex had experienced severe intimate partner violence. Mm -hmm. And most of them were from the US, most of them, uh, almost I think all but two or three were from what we would call high income nations. So the, what's the normal background rate of, of even just not severe intimate partner violence, but intimate partner violence, that would be 22%. So 48% mm. if my husband is a sex addict and in terms of porn, 98% of them reported their husbands were porn users. Wow. Wow. So that's way above the kind of the background rate. I want to throw out also just the actual statistic on the whole concept of choking and strangulation, because someone may be watching this and thinking, okay, they keep talking about this being a, a factor for homicide, but like what kind of factor are we talking about? And when we talk about choking, I know the, the common language is often, oh, he choked me or whatever, but it choking, like technically Choking is something that happens like you get a fishbone caught in your throat. It's something that happens on the inside. Mm -hmm. And in sexual breath play or violence, sexual assault, or whatever your partner is calling it, just acting out their fantasies, if there is restriction of the airway, that's called non NFS, non-fatal strangulation. And because it is enacted from the outside of the body, not choking on something on the inside of the body, and it increases your risk of homicide by that partner 750%. 750%. It's not just like, a, oh, well, then maybe it's just like this some kind of small risk factor. It is a massive risk factor for homicide if he has oh. ever restrained your breath and airway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a felony in many, and, many states. And it's depicted in pornography. Yeah. Yes. All the time as a totally yes. acceptable, normal way of getting turned on, which is- Well, but, but let's address that. So I was just recently interviewing a friend of mine who, his name is Brian Bennett, and he's a, a, a domestic violence a uh, specialist instructor at the South Carolina Criminal Justice Academy. He's been in law enforcement for like 25 years. Domestic violence and non-fatal strangulation is his area of stuff. And somebody went off on my page after I posted one of his articles and they were talking about, hey, y'all are basically insulting like the kink community. And as long yes, as we, we are. Sorry. <laughs> and as long as there's consent, <laughs> It should be okay, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I recognize that we cannot dictate what two consenting adults choose to do. However, the fact that you may have given what you believe to be consent does not change the fact that the erotica associated with breath play is still caused by asphyxiation, which is caused by the death of brain cells. Your brain cells don't not die just because you agreed to the activity. So asphyxiation as a form of sexual kink is just because it's been normalized, just because someone's told you that it's okay for you to say yes to it doesn't mean that it's not still creating lasting permanent brain damage, as well as increased homicide risk. So these uh, impacts on yeah, physical and sexual relationships are obviously so deep and multi-layered. I think we could spend a whole hour just really unraveling that subject. But I also want to make sure we have time to address you know, how does pornography impact relationships emotionally? And I know I've heard the term betrayal trauma in the discussion here. Um, and, and some people might not quite understand what that is still. So maybe we could unpack that a little bit and, and maybe also how to recognize those, that emotional impact as well. Uh, so 
betrayal trauma recovery, my organization. Um, betrayal trauma is a really interesting term because a lot of people use it for a lot of different things. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes they say it's from, like I talked about earlier, the disclosure of finding out that your husband's having had an affair and somehow that that betrayal causes the trauma, right? I believe that the trauma, the betrayal trauma is a betrayal of everything that that relationship is supposed to be. So it's not just a betrayal of um, sexual nature per se. It's a betrayal of trust. It's a trust. betrayal of safety. It's a betrayal of everything. It's what it really is betraying is that you are abusing your partner. If you abuse your partner in any way, you have betrayed her, period. And that abuse is what is causing the trauma. Now, in terms of betrayal specifically related to infidelity, right? So you're talking about specifically porn, specifically prostitutes, affairs, you know, physical acting out. That in and of itself, uh, in order to in enact those things, if you're in a committed relationship, then you also have all these other behaviors around it. It's never just going to be about the affair in and of itself. It's also going to be about gaslighting and lying, which is emotional and psychological abuse, which has occurred for months, years of surrounding the affair. So there's no way to really separate out. I think it's really important for people to understand that like, like he used porn, but he was really nice to her somehow. That's like, even if even if he shows up kindly, it's sort of a grooming type of kindness. It's not a genuine, real, authentic kindness. He is only being kind in that moment in order to deceive her, make sure she doesn't find out about the affair, make sure she doesn't find out about the porn. And so like, it's sometimes really hard for women who are victims of this type of abuse to sort out what's going on, because maybe sometimes they don't have, like, they might feel inside that something's wrong, but he's not screaming in her face. He's not punching walls. He's not, um, he's not strang strangling her in, in some cases, right? Like that type of thing mm -hmm. isn't happening. And so there's always this, in those situations, there's always kind of the mm -hmm. sense that something's wrong. And then she might ask like, what's wrong? Are you okay? And he's like, oh, everything's fine. I don't know. You know, and then she gets abused again, which is in the, in the form of gaslighting. So um, emotionally, it's always going to be really difficult, even if the perpetrator shows up as a very friendly, happy, supportive person that, mm -hmm. That in and of itself can be abuse when it's used for grooming purposes or when because it's used to deceive. It creates this massive amount of cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. I feel something's wrong. Right. Maybe I've developed unexplained infections or I've got an autoimmune condition now, or I am just constantly dealing with insomnia. I have this low grade anxiety that I never used to have. And so your body is telling you something is extremely messed up, but because you can't point your finger at any specific instant, he hasn't thrown you into a wall. He hasn't tossed you down on the bed and held you down forcibly to rape you. He's not strangling you. He's like, in those nice times, you're thinking, why does my body act like everything is so messed up? My mm -hmm. brain can't find anything to put its finger on. Mm -hmm. The cognitive dissonance, it leads to, like I said, autoimmune conditions, cancers, unresolved, ongoing, mysterious health issues, all kinds of things because psychological and emotional betrayal and abuse is physical abuse of the brain and the organ tissues. We just don't get to see the bruise mm -hmm. on the outside. Yeah. And, it, and that's it, why, I, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, that's why occasionally women feel relief when they find out. Yes. Oh, you're a porn user. You've been hiding that from me. Now. And suddenly it makes sense. sense. Yeah. yeah. Suddenly. And because I think like Anne was talking about, uh, we have this uh, this idea of betrayal trauma. Jennifer Freight was the psychologist who probably mm -hmm. used that term first. Mm -hmm. And she was describing the complex trauma that results from um, having someone on whom you rely, right? On whom mm -hmm. you, you know, this is one of your main attachment people, whether that's your parent, it's your parents or, or your, your partner or spouse. Um, and you rely on this person emotionally, maybe you rely on them financially. And to find out they are not who you thought they were and that they are not for you the way you thought that they were that 
creates massive anxiety for most women, right? That creates um, men too, if they're the, if they're the partner. Um, but women are often in that more vulnerable position with regards to men, especially at certain points of the life cycle, right? Pregnancy, breastfeeding, maybe I'm older, I'm retired, I don't have um, a financial independence. I work with a lot of women who are in their 60s, 65 and, and divorcing now, um, that's, a big, that's a big deal. Um, they're vulnerable and um, that ups that level of trauma then, right? If I have those higher levels of, of vulnerability, but trauma is trauma, right? Your symptoms that you see are kind of the same whether I'm the victim of, and as we're saying, so often they are the victims of domestic violence, right? It's so, it's very difficult. It's more a, ma a matter of helping them to see and helping the person with the addiction, if they want to heal, to see where they have been domestic violence perpetrators, um, that there's this complex trauma, probably, mm -hmm. the situation, mm -hmm. because it's been ongoing. And so all that hypervigilance, all that hyperarousal and hypoarousal is likely mm -hmm. going on right? I'm not sleeping. I'm not eating. I have nightmares. I have panic attacks. I, I, this huge startle reflex. These are the kinds of things that are, are normal, sadly, for women in these situations. Often it gets a little worse when they first find out. For most women, it's not a relief. It, it's actually, it can be met. I, I've heard of a woman being, had a heart attack. I have many women who vomit, right? Mm -hmm. This massive physiological reaction mm -hmm irritable bowel syndrome and just nonstop being um, irritated. Yeah, we, Lisa used the term domestic violence or DV for short. So if you've been listening, if you heard DV or you've heard domestic violence and you're thinking, well, he didn't punch her. So it's not violent. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the scope of domestic violence includes emotional and psychological abuse. So anytime you hear domestic violence, it, I, I think it might be easier for people who aren't familiar with DV to hear maybe domestic abuse. Cause maybe they're, they're not aware that like it's emotional, it's psychological violence. So even if and it's control. not, they don't have a bruise, they don't have some kind of punch in their face emotional and psychological abuse are still under the umbrella of domestic violence. Any domestic violence expert that you go to, they always include emotional and psychological abuse. So it just blows my mind that the pornography addiction recovery community in general does not take, like, doesn't talk about abuse first. Like this is an abuse mm -hmm. issue. It sh they should talk mm -hmm. about that first. That should be the number one thing. Um, but, and, and, and I, I, it just blows my mind that that's not, so, but, sorry, but I'm so much, no, no, no. I'm just like piggybacking on that. So much of the porn addiction community has come out of things that are rooted and steeped in sex as men's needs, mm. like mm. on the same level as water, air and nutrition, you know, that oh, not yeah. getting six, <laughs> not getting sex every 72 hours. Thank you, Jabe Stopson for making that one up, but yeah. not, not getting sex every 72 hours is like being buried alive in a coffin and dying a slow death. And you just, if your wife is not giving it up, <laughs> then you are entitled to mm. go get it elsewhere. And it will be her fault. She's a bad wife. It's wrong for you to do that, but it's kind of understandable because you have needs. She has no needs. Mm -hmm. Her need is to be there for you. And so when we come at it from even that subconscious, like deeply steeped kind of misogynistic assumption, a misogynistic patriarchal assumption. Can we say that stuff here, Haley? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Can we just like be super yes. blunt about it? Um, when we come at it from that perspective, even if that is just rooted in the subconscious, then we're much more likely to place the blame in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. Melinda, have, what have you seen from your um, discussions with young women along these lines? Young women are telling me increasingly accounts that show the grooming impacts of porn and porn culture. They don't talk in terms of certainly not respect or intimacy or connection you wouldn't you don't hear the word love like that's just totally like talking about kink that's almost like right out there uh, they don't talk about affection or kissing is considered way too intimate uh oral anal non-fatal strangulation well before <laughs> before a kiss 
Mm -hmm. uh, the stories I used to hear from senior secondary students, I'm now hearing from grades in Australia, grades six and seven. So we're talking 11, 12, 13. Uh, I've actually confessed to feeling in a state of despair the last two weeks. I was about to write, write about it this week because, as I say, I didn't think the stories could get worse. One phenomenon we have here, perhaps you have it in your countries as well, is the rise of sexual moaning noises by boys in the classroom, in the playground, on the school bus. Mm. Now, girls are telling me they're being subjected to this every day at school, including girls in grades five and six, every day, female teachers leaving the profession because they said we didn't go into the profession to be groaned at, grunted at, propositioned. Really young girls telling me they endure rape jokes every day. Now, these same girls would be subjected to uniform violations if their skirt wasn't long enough and is routinely measured. But they ask me, why do we have to hear rape jokes every day? Why do we have to hear the boys tell us that our mothers are MILFs and that they'd love to have sex with them? So the girls often think they have to endure this. Then they hear us speak and realise they're being victims of sexual harassment and crimes. And I say to the schools, your schools are crime scenes because mm -hmm. you haven't addressed this. Schools have a legal duty of care to provide a safe educational environment and a safe workplace for female teachers. And they have failed. Mm -hmm. And among the worst stories I've heard in the last two weeks from two solid faith-based schools were not only that the girls were all being sexually moaned and groaned at every day with no action taken against the boys, the girls were being subjected to this during daily worship in the chapel at school, during worship. So there is no safe space. Mm. There's no sacred space. There's nowhere that these girls are not subjected to sexually intrusive behaviours from the boys. Mm. Girls getting rape notes in their lockers. Girls seeing pictures of um, photocopied penises on the front, pasted to the front of their lockers. Boys consuming porn in the classroom, in the schoolyard, on the school bus. Young girls telling me now boys are actually masturbating to them on the school bus. Yeah. I was and a junior I high teacher. Admit, I've had I my days where I, you know, is this, can this be turned around? Is it too late? Teachers, they tell the teachers, uh, often the teachers don't have a clear process in their schools. Mm -hmm. You know, that there's not a clear process to deal with disclosures, uh, to deal with sexual moaning. I tell female teachers subjected to this, call the police call the police and maybe then the school will take notice, call your union, call your teacher's union and call your occupational health and safety representative who should all know about this. Like it is so endemic that I think there needs to be like a national walkout of teachers, a national day of action. Teachers walk out on for other issues, certainly in this country. Why not walk out uh, on the basis of the daily sexual harassment? We've spoken to teachers who won't walk to their car at the end of the day unless they've checked the security footage first to see if there are boys on the path between them and their car because mm. of what they will be subjected to. Mm. It's getting worse. It's getting worse younger. Uh, the, the fruits of porn and porn culture are now being seen. And, you know, this may sound rhetorical. It's just how I feel at the moment, so I'm going to say it. You know, we talk about, you know, maybe doomsday is coming. There are days I wonder maybe we're here. <laughs> maybe we're in doomsday. Mm -hmm. With all the stories girls are telling me every day, with all the women contacting me in relation to the book, uh, all the stories of abuse and violence that women are subjected to. You know, I have underage girls saying, he went for my throat without even asking. You know, this is the daily lived reality of, I would say, most young women that I encounter so I need one of you to speak something hopeful. I know there's hope because girls contact me and say, yeah. after hearing our message, they're going to stand up for themselves. They've reported abuse. They're not going to tolerate um, violation of their boundaries. They realise they have a right to say no and not be made to feel bad about it. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the positive feedback to the book. So I do need to remind myself and, of course, all of you good women working in this space. It's just that I've come off the end of this last tour with the worst stories I've ever heard and I'm still processing that to be to be honest with you all yes oh that's I mean it's you've all painted really I think instructional and helpful 
pictures of of reality of whether that's um an mm-hmm. intimate committed relationship you know mm-hmm. just youth uh and just the general culture as well the way that pornography does have these mm-hmm. ripple effects and so many mm-hmm. ramifications that just often aren't being discussed um as we're transitioning to the last few minutes of um this panel we could we could do a whole conference just on this topic there's so much to discuss here um and that's why i should really do that excited. haley we should. should do that i think we, we should. should yeah and everyone and i'm encouraging in the meantime while we organize that everyone needs to go and dive into the resources that you all are providing as well because there's so much more to discuss but i would love for us to end with as melinda said what are what are the steps people can take towards either personal or relationship healing. Uh, People who are watching this could be all across the spectrum in their experiences. They could be in relationships right now where this is a problem. They could have exited relationships. Um, They could just be a bit overwhelmed um, thinking about this topic. So if any advice you have on personal or relationship healing and reasons for hope, I think would be a wonderful way to end this panel. Mm-hmm. Go, um, Anne. I'll follow. I apologize, Melinda. I, I was, I interrupted you. I was a junior high teacher for nine years and I ended teaching in 2008. And the last year I, the last year I taught two boys masturbated in my class, um, that I witnessed with my own eyeballs. So it's a lot worse now, but it was pretty crazy. So I was like, Oh my gosh, that's happened to me. That's so sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, thanks for sharing <laughs> that. And, so, um, wow. in terms of relational healing, I want to talk about that first. Mm-hmm. So many women, when they first find out that's their top priority, because divorce seems like the worst case scenario, right? They're just terrified. They don't want their family to be torn apart. And it's really hard. The only way, the only way a relationship quote unquote can heal is if that abuse is completely stopped, period. So there's really no way for the relationship to heal as a like couple thing where they're both working on their part or something like that. That is just not how abuse works. So unless the victim views the situation as an abuse situation, this is being perpetrated on me. I am a victim of abuse. You don't have to, that's not to say that they're like, have to stay in victimhood but like realizing that like there's nothing we can do together to like fix this he's going to need to stop abusing me then um there's there's really no other like way of of facing it and so I think that relationally is kind of a trap that so many victims fall into especially in the pornography addiction recovery space And they will be a lot better off focusing on their own healing from abuse and noticing also and and acknowledging what they're healing from. In order to heal, you have to know what you're healing from. You are healing from abuse, right? And you, you can do that as an individual and you may be able to do it in relation to your abuser, but you'll have to do that only, but the only way the relationship will heal is if the abuse has stopped. Mm -hmm. I want to add another angle, and that is as a parent, because we're talking about the prevalence, the pervasiveness, Mm -hmm. Melinda, what you've shared, just, it gives me goosebumps Mm -hmm. and not the kind that's like, wow, that's a beautiful song. I mean, Mm -hmm. like the chilling, this is, this is so profoundly disturbing kind. Um, And for me, that hits very close to home. I have middle school aged kids. I have homeschooled my kids and they are now in a private school for the first time, both of them this school year. Um, And I want to talk about the potential for hope and healing as we look at supporting the next generation. I believe wholeheartedly as the mother of both a daughter whom I want to know that she can fiercely stand up for herself but also as the mother of a son who Mm -hmm. I want to be able to grow up and have meaningful, deep relational and eventually sexual intimacy in the right context and have that be rich, vibrant parts of his life that are not tainted by sexploitation. 
So I'm looking at this, not just from the perspective of someone who went through betrayal trauma and was a survivor in my own right, but forward looking, how do we help the younger ones who are growing up so immersed, many of them in this as normalcy that they don't even realize that in sixth or seventh grade, going for a girl's throat is just not something that a healthy human would ever, ever do. That's like a serial killer move, not just a sixth grade sexual encounter kind of move. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it is so incredibly important for us to remember if you are in a family where you think your kids are not exposed to things like this, stop diluting yourself. Mm -hmm. And there are incredible materials. I know we can give you lists of books. Probably all of us have different ones that we really like that we can refer to you to put in the show notes for women to mothers, parents, fathers, if you're watching this, to use to spark conversations with your kids. Gail Dines has terrific materials for conversations at Culture Reframed. His uh, Good Pictures, Bad Pictures is another really great one to start conversations. In addition, if you have kids that are so little, you can't imagine having any kind of sex-related talk, you can start teaching them about consent and respect for other people's bodies and preferences and likes and dislikes at the age of two. If they can talk, if they can grab a block out of another kid's hand, you can start teaching them about consent and you can start modeling for them how consent is important because we value other people's yes and other people's no. It doesn't have to be a sexualized conversation. Haley, you just had a baby. You know, like you can be discussing consent in mm. completely age appropriate ways in like six months <laughs> with your child. <laughs> and I believe that in today's world, just a trip to the mall, to the shopping center is so sexualized in so many societies that we have to be having very open, transparent conversations with our children about what is appropriate, what is not appropriate, what is a violation of consent, what is a violation of bodily autonomy, and giving them terms to use so that if something happens to them, they know, hey, that was actually a crime, and I'm going to go talk to someone about it because I don't have to put up with that crap. And empowering our sons and our daughters to not accept this as the baseline of their generation. Well said, Lisa, what are, what are your thoughts as well? On I'll speak, I'll speak from what the research showed me. So I've mentioned this research, this was done through the University of Auckland. Um, you can find it at anybody can read the whole paper. Um, it's my master's, uh, master's in counseling research um, at psadv.study. So when we were looking, I was looking for what what's associated with you know higher forms of violence. What's associated with with you know we call negatively associated in a quantitative study with violence. And therefore, I, I mean it's associated with a lack of violence. Well, his getting um, professional help was associated with the women reporting no current violence. They may have reported historical violence, mm -hmm. but now the the current violence was was not so much there. Well, that's the good news for, for my community. Um, do we as a community, well, boy, I mean, the paper is a call to, to the whole therapeutic community to write, to, to have this in mind. We have to be assessing or we have to be prepared to refer. Um, it's gotta be as Polly, uh, sorry, it's gotta be, <laughs> as has already been mentioned, like it's gotta be more um, in the conversation and, and you know, they're in the forefront of counselors' minds who are working in this field, that, that the violence has to be dealt with. Um, to, if you're a guy who's struggled in this area and you're listening and you're thinking, wow, this, this feels hard because I'm being told that I'm an abuser by nature, um, we, we need to just kind of put that on the table and destigmatize that, right? You've been trained, you've been well-trained by the porn industry, maybe by others, we have to look into that. What's that about? Um, and learn new ways and learn better ways. Many men have walked out of this and have come to be um, more whole, more loving, 
more respectful people who like themselves. In fact, who frequently can't believe I was that guy back there, mm-hmm. right? And as a therapeutic community, we'd love to accompany you on that journey. Um, and everything that Anne said, right? Ladies, if this is your husband you're talking about, you need to stand for health. You need to be the healthiest, wholest you, and you need to have boundaries and you need to understand that. And it's a journey often for many of us. I have lost one marriage um, with, with a porn addict slash sex addict who would not get help. I'm in a second relationship that has very much survived and is thriving with a former porn user who has gotten that help. Um, there's a limit to how much control we have as the partner, mm-hmm. but we have a lot of control over us. We have right. a lot of control over how healthy I'm going to be and what I'm going to stand for in this world and what I'm not going to stand for in this world. I have power there. Mm. Yeah. And Melinda, could you uh, end, end us with your, your call to hope? I know you just shared being in a, a bit of a darker place, having done this really difficult um, work that you're working on right now. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really appreciate what's already been said, and I I have taken extensive notes. I might just read the the closing paragraph from my introduction. Would that be okay, the introduction to the book? Because I think I need to remind myself of this as well. I hope this book will help women demand high standards in relationships, be more discerning, recognise the signs, and turn away from men who consume porn, and that more broadly individuals who value intimacy, connection, mutuality, empathy, and compassion, to quote Robert Jensen, quote, the emotions that make stable, decent human communities possible, will endeavor to protect these essential qualities from being devoured by the global porn industry. And I must say, I am encouraged by the number of young people globally that are joining the anti-porn movement that are really leading the way because it's my generation that's really messed this up. But I do find there are seeds of hope in the new generation that is resisting the toxic messages of porn, saying we don't want our intimate lives to be dictated by pornography scripts. We want something that's real and meaningful and um, loving. Uh, So I, I think we can find hope in this generation that is rising up in a movement of global resistance against the predatory uh, global multi-billion dollar porn industry, which they have recognised is uh, preying on them, grooming them and harming them. And now they're demanding something better. So I, I hope that's uh, that's a sign of hope, I think. Yeah. Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. And another sign of hope is just you wonderful women, the incredible work that you're doing, helping uh, individuals, helping couples and helping shift society as well uh, Mm -hmm. relating to these harms so thank you so much for all that you're doing and again everyone listening I just encourage you to dive deeper with uh, these women and their organizations so thank you all so much thank you Haley thank you thanks Haley